Stephen John Young Reed was born in Durban in the last century. <laughs> and, and in recognition of his birthday, which is happening this coming Sunday, you all invited to a pre-birthday party in the foyer afterwards. <laughs> As the middle son of John and Louise Reed, Steve is a living example of the power of inheritance. So allow me just to explain. His mum, Louise, is an alumna of the Slade Art School in London and is, by all accounts, a highly talented and gifted artist who still paints, but regrettably for us, no longer exhibits. In his childhood, Steve and his siblings did their homework in his mum's studio on the floor, and so this, they were thus directly exposed to a wonderful gift as an artist and subconsciously to the importance of art in one's life. His late dad, John, an Oxford medical graduate, held positions as professor of physiology in the Department of Medicine at the University of Natal, where he was a legendary academic and teacher, and later as deputy vice chancellor here at the University of Cape Town. This genetic endowment was enriched by the family's deep commitment to social justice, which was expressed through formal links with progressive organizations of the day, but also through action. For I recall Prof. Reed in his position as Deputy Vice-Chancellor, leaving the hallowed halls of uh, Bremner to accompany us to the heart of the struggle activities and conflicts on the Cape Flats in the 1980s to explore how UCT could be more supportive in situations of forced removals and violent oppression uh, of the community. This legacy of art, health, education, and social justice set the direction for Steve's career and his life course. And stories from his early childhood helped to better understand some of his choices. As a little boy, his mom says, his passion for assembling model aeroplanes with keen dexterity and absolute precision suggested a future career in surgery. <laughs> Although some of that did come true, Steve is a superb clinician with a special talent for surgery. His surgical skills have now been redirected to the shaping of incredible birthday cakes. Because I believe that as a cake sculptor, his creations have ranged from dragons with snaking tails to rockets and mice. <laughs> but his childhood, Ill, his childhood experiences were to be far more prescient, for despite having a very comfortable bed in a very comfortable room at their home in Durban, Steve chose instead to sleep on the veranda, night after night, covering himself with a plastic sheet when it rained. This was the young Steve, the adventurer, the adrenaline junkie, the person who did things differently then and who continues to flourish out of the box. But as a colleague said, nevertheless, he knows where the box is. <laughs> because, and this is because of his commitment to addressing the challenges of social injustice and inequity by his choice of career and also by giving practical expression to his deep faith. Following his school years at Michael House, where he developed his love of running, I suspect, uh, away from the Michael House culture, he entered UCT as a medical student in 1978, the same year that the historical Alma Ata Declaration of Primary Health Care was formulated. Far from what is now known as Almaty in Kazakhstan, a different story was unfolding. As Janet Giddy, a new medical student arrived in this big city from the little town of Maritzburg. The car deposited her in a space between Fuller and Smuts Halls, and the first person she laid eyes on was the golden boy himself. <laughs> and that was that. The imprinting had taken place, and via the anatomy laboratory, uh, Steve's year away to complete a BSc med with his gurus, Professor Vilan Hevers, who's here tonight, and Tim Lokes, through the Christian Medical Fellowship, through, through their clinical years, the partnership was consolidated to culminate in a joint wedding with Jill and John Frame, some years later, and to develop into what has been sustained as a rich and interesting partnership 
of commitment to each other, to family, to society, and to addressing health equity. Yeah, yeah, say his colleagues, his friends, and his family. For Steve is a dedicated family man. And while Janet and his children, Luke, James, Joanna, and John, take priority in his life, he also takes priority in theirs. They commend him for his humble approach to life, his fun, his adventures, and keeping them grounded, often quite literally, which Janet describes as the downside of his risk-taking. As the children fly over the handlebars and sustain multiple fractures and injuries in the course of the thrill of hurtling down some mountain on an uncharted route. Coming out excited by the achievement and imbued with the courage to take on almost anything. Janet describes Steve's characteristic to his Viking blood, having both Irish and Scottish ancestry. For while he is, is an adventurer who is willing to go beyond what may seem to be sensible or safe, it's this pioneering sense which has been at the heart of his choice of jobs, his success as a leader in rural health care and in innovative health sciences education. His children say that the image which dominates is one of doing things that expresses freedom, like mountain biking and kite flying. They say that when, he, when they hear about what he works on, what he writes about, and what changes he's trying to bring about, they realize that he doesn't just keep the best for his family, he shares it with everybody else too. The impression of, the, of a rural doctor working in a mission hospital, weaving together a holy ambience with music played in tiny rural churches, in sitting rooms, and even outdoor services, seemed to one of his children to be a useful skill then. And it surely can also work for a primary healthcare professor in this lecture theater. His mum says it all in a few words. He is just so genuine. And the black eyed peas say, <laughs> I've got a feeling that tonight's going to be a good night. <laughs> so it now gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce Professor Steve Reed to deliver his inaugural lecture, The Music of Health for All. what I wanted to say this evening. Gaudi Amos Nikatur, directly translated, actually means, let us rejoice, therefore. So, <laughs> but I do want to connect this time-honored ritual in Latin that reminds us of the accumulated wisdom and traditions of our academic past to a local and contemporary musician who celebrates our collective South African heritage. Abdullah Ibrahim's Man and Burgers Where It's At. 
is the title of the last passage that I just played. He's an icon of the jazz world. And in my mind, his music provides a parallel of the notion of health for all. So allow me to unpack this a little bit over the next 40 minutes. The title, Music of Health for All, gives you the idea that I will try to represent the concepts and principles of primary health care using medical and musical analogies. Now, this is more than just a clever device for keeping you awake during this lecture. <laughs> and I must admit, a special challenge to keep the head of the Division of Urology awake for a whole lecture. <laughs> a feat which is seldom achieved. <laughs> but seriously, I hope to show that music has intrinsic quality beyond its aesthetic and uh, therapeutic effects that can help us to understand healthcare better, and primary healthcare in particular. This may be an unusual inaugural lecture for a medical faculty, but every lecture is, an, is something of a performance. And the equivalent of a professor maybe in the department of music would be a recital of pieces that is selected and played by him or her. I'm not a professional musician, but what I lack in technique, I make up for in enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> you see, there's this, this right brain source of irrational passion that I think is part of each one of us in this room, in some way or other. And it is largely untapped. For me, music is one way of accessing this energy. But I want to understand, I want to introduce an understanding of music as more than just an assembly and progression of musical notes, but more of a state of being, a broader process that brings together and integrates a wide, wide variety of, of, of issues. Just as an example, I sit in an endless succession of meetings as part of my work, as many of you do also, and I reflected on my role in them as a musician. A meeting is like a piece of music. First, there's a start, which could be an invitation or an announcement, followed by a succession of experiences with a limited timeline, uh, consisting of the concepts and the ideas, the proposals, the decisions, as well as the interruptions, the crises, even the silences. They're the participants themselves, and there's usually an overall direction uh, or an alignment with a common goal. And finally, there's an ending, a conclusion sometimes with an outcome. Music is a combination of sounds that are organized in time using these same elements to form a whole. So, I started asking myself in these meetings, what is the music that I can hear in this meeting? Can I hear it? And this led to a different way of listening and interacting in meetings, a more active engagement. Trying to hear or elicit the quiet whispers or the unspoken feelings and silences that give an indication of what is really happening in the room over and above what is actually being said. <coughs> every form of creative art has a very practical and pragmatic component. If you think of the manual skills required of a sculptor to fashion uh, a beautiful figure out of a lump of stone, or the skills required of a, mu of a musician to play an instrument. So in much the same way as we in the medical profession would describe the key components of clinical method as the history, examination, differential diagnosis, special investigations, management, treatment, and ongoing care. The technical aspects of music are well described by music theorists, such as melody, harmony, rhythm, tempo, timbre or tone, and others. It's one line, one note at a time, often played by a solo instrument. And later on, I'll play it on the violin. Does it make sense? On its own like that, it's rather isolated and difficult to understand. So, if I add the harmony, which consists of two minor chords, followed by two major chords, maybe it'll 
will start to make a little more sense. The melody needs the harmony, and vice versa, in order to create the whole. And here we come to a bit of primary health care and a bit of theory. It's a perspective or an approach, not a sequential set of actions, and I like to explain it like this. Most of clinical practice is premised on the presentation of a patient who's feeling unwell to a healthcare practitioner. And this interaction is central to the clinical method and the whole of medical practice, and we call this the practice population. But it assumes that the patient is indeed a patient who is by definition already ill. <coughs> and this immediately presents a problem in my mind because our responsibility extends to those like you and I who are not ill, at least at the moment, and therefore do not regard ourselves as patients. So every patient is drawn from a wider population that I would call the population at risk. <laughs> and it's something like the harmony. It consists of those who are not ill, or do not know themselves to be ill, or do not know that, believe that they're ill, even if they're feeling sick. <laughs> it's difficult to understand the patient in isolation of the context that they come from. It's difficult to understand the melody <coughs> apart from the harmony. And we're all, actually, in this category, we are all at risk not only of flu or gastroenteritis or cancer, but of motor vehicle accidents and other such calamities that could turn us into patients in an instant. The whole of this diagram, the so-called practice population, and the population at risk, is the target of the primary health care approach in terms of health for all. So whereas the medical model focuses on the person who presents as a patient, Primary healthcare focuses on the whole population, whether they are ill or not. Just as the melody makes more sense in terms of the harmony, the individual patient makes more sense in terms of the context in which they became ill. And the demarcation between the two is a line, that heavy black line there that, that's, that, are, that is called access to care. And often, often it's a barrier. <coughs> In fact, more often than, than we realize, it's an enormous barrier to those in the population at risk who desperately need care but cannot get it for a whole range of reasons and no fault of their own. Financial, social, political, <coughs> geographical, psychological. These are also the reasons that patients arrive in hospital with so-called late presentations when it's more, much more difficult and much, much more expensive to deal with their problems. And this is what the woeful health statistics of this country show. That despite our best clinical efforts, the important health status indicators in this country continue to get worse. Maternal mortality, infant mortality, HIV, TB. And I'll, I won't depress you with the statistics which have been comprehensively described in the Lancet Journal and elsewhere. Health for all means just that. Not health for some, or health for the fortunate few, or health for those who have medical insurance. Health for all is a deceptively simple concept with extraordinarily far-reaching implications. A number of studies have shown how the quality of care falls progressively the further the person is away from the center. This is true in the geographic sense, if one considers any subspeciality, such as urology. <laughs> Just checking, please. The quality of care centrally in Kritzkia, for example, falls off compared to Kailicha. And then compared with somewhere like both West and then with the Eastern Cape. Even in the Eastern Cape, there's rural and there's remote rural. Maybe one of these lines should represent the Hottentots Holland Mountains. <laughs> so I trained here in Cape Town, but as soon as I qualified, I went over those mountains to the, the outer edges here. 
And in fact, about as far as, as it's possible to go without leaving the country, to a village called Ibamba in KwaZulu Natal. So we lived and worked on this geographical margin for 10 years, and my perspective was molded significantly by that experience. This diagram is not only true in terms of geography, though. It's also true in a financial sense. If we think of those who have access to the private sector through a comprehensive medical aid plan, think of them as being proximal compared to those who have to fork out significant co-payments to those who pay out of pocket, down to those who can't afford private sector at all and are totally dependent on the public sector for care. So there are degrees of access depending on a number of factors. And the problem is that at the center, a critical mass is needed to maintain highly specialized services. And that effectively excludes those who don't have access, not just to the services themselves, but to the potential of that access. The so-called digital divide is a good example of this. Those who have access to the internet are on an exponentially faster development curve that accelerates away from those who are not digitally connected. <laughs> this is how gross inequities develop. Not necessarily intentionally, but structurally. Paul Farmer calls it structural violence of the rich towards the poor invoking the dynamics of power that perpetuate these inequities as inequities that become inequities despite well-intentioned plans to overcome them. Clearly, clinicians cannot continue waiting for patients to arrive on their doorsteps and treating them once they get there, even if that treatment is of the highest quality. We need a more inclusive definition of excellence that extends beyond the patient in the bed to the person who's not in the bed, who cannot present themselves, but who may well fill the same bed next week or next month unless we do something about the factors that cause and perpetuate the illness in the population at risk. We need to teach our students about the patient in the bed, but also about the patient who's not in the bed, as it were. We obviously need to act in the population at risk area, proactively identifying those who are at greatest risk and providing them with access to prevention strategies, access to diagnosis, care when it's needed as soon as possible, and access to rehab and follow-up when it's called for. It's what I call community engagement, which is also well described as community-oriented primary care, or COPC, a proactive movement outwards into the population at risk that was pioneered in the 1950s by Dr. Sidney and Emily Clark in rural KwaZulu. In the first instance, this boils down to activities such as active case finding, early detection, follow-up, outreach, mobile clinics, screening, home visits. Because of the dilutional effect, it means clearly identifying those on the margin of the circle and making extra efforts to reach them and provide them with information about health as well as access to preventative and curative services. These are all things that doctors don't do particularly well, particularly if we compare this to the general standard of our clinical method. The problem is that doctors are not enabled to get involved outside of the medical environment. The further away from the central clinical role, the more they are forced to rely on a team of other, people, other health workers and the less secure they feel. But outreach activities, as well-intentioned and effective as they are in themselves, are not enough. Dealing effectively with inequity starts with defining the all. That is quantifying and characterizing the extent of the whole population that is at risk. If this isn't done, no rational or equitable planning can happen because those closest to the center tend to get the most attention and resources. So, there's some primary health care shared a theory in a nutshell. The individual in the context of the collective, the melody with the harmony. 
Let me move to my next point. I'm going to need some help from all of you with this one, if you will. It's a Dave Brubeck number. In seven time, if meets in a bar. And I'm going to ask my brother Matthew, who's a professional musician, to help us out. So what I want you to do is to tap your fingers, two fingers, on the palm, in between beats one, three, and five. So, you've got a tap in between my beats. I do one, you do one. I do another one, you do another. And I do a third one, and you do two. So it goes like this. One, 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 two, two. Okay, you got it, right? Health status indicators 
are improving. I need to be clear about terminology here, which can be confusing, related to the phrase primary healthcare, as denoting an overarching approach as opposed to primary care, which is an operational level of the health system in a hierarchy with secondary care and tertiary care. The two terms are often confused, and this is more than just semantics, because the primary health care approach as denoting health for all can equally be applied to subspecialties at tertiary level as at the primary level of care. And there's some great examples right under our noses here in Cape Town. The radiology and oncology department, for example, is launching their survivorship program by actively reaching out to primary care community level. The TRACI team at Red Cross Hospital organizes for kids from ICU who have tracheostomies. Those of you who don't know, those are just little tubes inserted to keep their airways open to go home after training their caregiver, caregivers how to take care of them. The ear, nose, and throat team goes out to the Bulan town towns with their clinics and teaching. And the ophthalmology department here hosts the Vision 2020 program that looks at eye health from the population perspective of the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. For the Ugandan registrar, who I met here training in neurosurgery, in order to become the second only neurosurgeon in the whole of Uganda, planning for health for all makes complete sense when resources especially are extremely limited. What these units are effectively doing is addressing this line, these lines, these barriers to access. But as I said earlier, outreach in itself is not enough without engaging the total population. And this is where we need, desperately need better coordination with the primary level of care in order to reach those outer margins. Barbara Starfield, who passed away recently, was a doyen of evidence-based primary care, primary care, right? And clearly demonstrated that greater investments by a country in the primary level of care leads to better health outcomes and less inequality in health status. She wrote about the three C's as making a difference. Comprehensiveness, continuity, and coordination. Continuity refers to the longitudinal effect of care through relationships over time regardless of the presence or absence of illness. Something that is sorely lacking in our public health service. Comprehensiveness refers to the ability of a generalist-based health service to effectively deal with the majority of presenting problems at primary level and keeping referrals to a, limit, to a minimum. Whereas coordination is the, about the ability to organize services that are only available at certain places in the health system around the patient's needs. It must be made clear that this approach is different to the clinical disciplines based on specialties that operate at secondary and tertiary levels of the health system, but it's not contrary to them. They must be complementary. The point is that the primary level of care demands different approaches, and these have been shown to result in greater equity in health care. And this brings me to my next musical item. Because I'd like to, if this will do its thing, I'd like to demonstrate something about diversity. There it is. When I played the Brubeck just now, there would be some of you in this room who find it <coughs> enjoyable. There would be others who were neither turned on nor turned, or turned off by it and could take it or leave it. And there would be other third group who can't stand any junky sort of music and would have turned it off if it was played on the radio in the car. The point is that there's inevitably a great diversity of response to music because we're all different. And it's such a subjective thing. This one likes Baroque. I like the classical romantics. That one likes hip hop. Somebody else prefers music from the Cape Flats. <laughs>
like this. guidelines or the routine procedure for a particular condition is merely a starting point. Even the best evidence-based studies based on randomized controlled trials, the objective evidence as we know it, can only give us averages and confidence intervals. They cannot predict how a particular drug or procedure will affect this particular patient at this particular time in this particular situation, which is always unique. And this is where we have no option but to rely on the subjective, the so-called art of medicine. Because the protocols and guidelines and evidence from the journals can take us only so far, but no further. And the rest is up to our clinical judgment. This is the realm of complexity theory. And it's where musical experience can help directly, not necessarily in making a diagnosis or a decision about management, but in teaching us how to sift and make sense of all the multitude of cues and clues and issues that surround an episode of illness in a particular individual at a particular time. By seeing, or maybe it is by hearing the whole, we can make sense of the parts. The ancient Greeks recognized the role of music. They considered <coughs> astronomy and music be opposites, whereas astronomy was the study of large external objects visible in the night sky, they maintained that music is the understanding of the internal relationship between invisible objects. The internal relationship, the internal relationship between invisible objects. It allows us to move around those big invisible pieces of ourselves and rearrange them inside so that we can express what we feel 
even when you can't talk about it. Science constructs evidence deduced from controlling the variables and reducing the phenomena to its constituent parts, the external visible objects, and examining them each independently. Whereas on the one hand, science reduces, to a certain extent, it loses the relationship between the external objects. At the under, other end of the spectrum, music creates the whole by bringing the internal objects into relation with one another. It represents the glue that holds things together. Western medicine is also a reductionist in theory, but in practice, something often Something different often actually happens because we're dealing with people and not with objects. So I would situate the practice of medicine somewhere between these two poles, taking from both paradigms as necessary. So if I placed Western classical music, like specialized Western medicine, in the smaller circle and in the larger circle of music for all, I placed hip-hop, rap, and jazz, and gospel, and rock. Maybe I could still call this a line of access. Western classical music is to a certain extent elitist and exclusive, appealing and accessible to relatively few people. But to those who know it, and listen to it, and play it, it's real music. Just as the medical fraternity regards evidence-based medicine as the only real deal. But we're all different. The jazz musician, the gospel fan, the rapper <coughs> see things differently. The traditional healer definitely sees things differently to Western trained doctors. I like Abdullah Ibrahim's music because it's inclusive, it's widely appealing, and at the same time, it's world class. I think it's what South African medicine should be. Not just excellent, but also accessible to all, such that we can be as proud of it as we are of Abdullah Ibrahim. When we say that primary health care is the lead theme of this faculty, it means that our teaching, our research, and our clinical practice should be suffused by this notion of health for all. That the excellence that we so earnestly and appropriately strive for must be accessible to all those who need it, and not just a few. I see our role in the primary health care directorate, PHCD in the middle there, as bringing the best that biomedical science has to offer at the top, to be more accessible to communities, and at the same time linking education with service. For all its history, and misunderstanding in this faculty. The aspiration is that primary health care can bring it all together like music. For the final musical interview, you'll be happy to hear. <laughs> I've chosen to return to classical music from the Romantic era in the form of a piano trio by Max Brook, who lived from 1838 until 1920. <coughs> Before we play it, and I'll say a few words afterwards, let me explain a little bit about this piece and give you access, as it were, <coughs> to those of you who are unfamiliar with it, into the hallowed halls of 19th century romantic music. And in the process, help hopefully help you to hear some of the beauty of the trio. I'll be joined by, by my sister, Susan, on the piano, and Fiona Greyer from the KwaZulu Natal Philharmonic Orchestra on the cello. It begins with the violin playing higher, that simple melody that I played at the beginning. The piano part gives the harmony, you will remember, in a minor key, but it quickly changes to a major key. The violin then completes the melody, and both are then echoed by the cello <coughs> two octaves below. 
And then what Brooke does is to alternate major and minor key. Listen for it all the way through the whole piece as he develops this simple theme. Think of a clinical consultation or a surgical operation, moving between lighter and darker moments and coming together halfway through just as the themes of the violin and the cello do. But also, listen to the mere sound that the three instruments create together, how they relate to each other. The piano setting off the two strings, creating a platform for the dialogue between violin and cello. It's a nocturne, a nighttime song. I think it's almost night now. And it's played very softly, ending calmly in triple piano. I'm going to turn this off and we're going to play without amplification, so you'll have to listen very carefully. If music is the study of the internal relationships between invisible objects, as the Greeks put it, then use the next six minutes to switch off your overactive left brain and see if you can rearrange some of your own invisible internal objects.
We have the means, we have the resources, the knowledge, and the understanding to prevent, cure, or ameliorate almost the entire burden of disease. But we found out on some basic principles of social justice and solidarity, and the collective will to actually make the necessary changes. In the context of constitution that states that access to health care is a human right, this is quite simply unacceptable. Compared to the general standard of our clinical method with the individual patient, it's atrocious. Other developing countries have shown that it's possible to reverse the trends towards greater inequality and to actually achieve the Millennium Development Goals through courageous leadership, effective management, and civil participation around a common vision. This is what the National Health Insurance announced by the Minister of Health recently sets out to do. And I believe it deserves the full support of all of us. Finally, I don't know what health for all actually sounds like. A number of students and I are starting an interest group around the creative arts and health. And if you're interested, please contact us through one of these links. When I originally thought about this topic, and I imagined actually playing something called the music of health for all tonight, I initially thought about trying to play a grand work by a famous composer. But I don't think that any one person has all of the answers or can write all the music for all the people, all the time. It must be a collective effort, a participative, inclusive one, using our diversity to advantage. It's up to all of us together to create it, using primary healthcare as a kind of music to bring together more than just the sum of the individual parts. Thank you very much. The, an inaugural lecture uh, is certainly intended to impress. <laughs> Usually with respect to the academic talents of the professor. Today we have witnessed uh, the talents and skills of what one can only call a Renaissance man. <laughs> and it is perhaps more importantly an evidence of what it means to become a professor, and that is to have mastered the skills of professing. And it's the skills of professing which are educating, demonstrating, entertaining, engaging, convincing, that we have seen so masterfully demonstrated in our inaugural lecture today. And I want to thank you, Steve, for setting a bar so high. I can't imagine anyone climbing or jumping over it <laughs> in the future. But I don't have to jump over it, I just have to host them. <laughs> Steve has made it his business to explore and provide answers for difficult, poorly researched topics. And I will list a few so that you can gain some insight into the scope of this man's work. What procedural skills are needed by rural doctors? What is the impact of community-based healthcare interventions? What is the impact of community service on healthcare in South Africa? Do rural students return to rural practice? What about the retention and recruitment of health professionals in rural areas in South Africa? What about interventions to address the inequitable distribution of healthcare professionals in South Africa. What are the educational factors that influence the urban rural distribution of healthcare professionals? What is the contribution of South African curricula to preparing health professionals for working in rural and underserved areas? What about rural medicine as a subspecialty? And most recently, the pedagogy of rural health. Steve has put flesh on the bones of rural medicine in South Africa, and his work is ranked with that of international experts in as far afield as Canada and Australia, 
where these questions have also been asked, but in a strikingly different context. He's committed to changing rural health in South Africa and is walking the talk. In his journey at this university, he has been generous enough to extend a welcoming hand to those who share his beliefs but have little expertise and knowledge. In this regard, I speak from personal experience. What about Steve's role as an advocate? I think I have sketched the landscape of his work and research sufficiently clearly to demonstrate his commitment to providing health care for those without a voice in this land of contrasts and ongoing inequities. Just today, I was in a meeting with Steve and in his quiet, well-considered way, he explained to us that the faculty admission process may not be as equitably accessible to all as we may think to those who aspire to study at this prestigious university. What has been Steve's response? Being a practical man, he's initiated a project to take the necessary information about this university and its admission process to those who might not access it and open doors where these do not exist. Steve and I still have a long road to travel. He's not 60 and I'm not 50. That gives us at least 10 years. <laughs> Steve, I don't know what the road ahead looks like, but I am sure that you will populate it with more scholarly contributions to the rural health agenda in South Africa, that you will inspire students to take medicine to the community, and that you will enhance UCT's profile as a major role player in the future of health sciences education and research on this continent. You challenge us to think big, reach far, and change what seems impossible. In true Steve style, he has requested that I make an unscheduled announcement in the middle of this presentation. <laughs> That's like Steve.